What I think is even actually more interesting is that uh, some studies have shown that students with exceptionality who are included in the regular classroom experience serious social difficulties beyond those in other settings. There's even research to suggest that kids in segregated classrooms actually get bullied more. So we sometimes have this notion that I have to keep a child in a special class because they'll be protected and the other kids will pick on them. And I have to make sure that they're safe and we have to teach them social skills in here so they can go out into this big world. But the research actually tells us that when children are in segregated classrooms, they actually experience more bullying. And part of that is about the isolation and the otherness of those children. Um, in a large pan-Canadian study, one of the largest ever conducted with multiple researchers, they looked at low inclusion versus high inclusion settings. And the researchers found that regardless of the type of disability, students in high inclusive settings, so these are students who, are, who have physical handicaps, these are students with intellectual handicaps, these are students with mental health issues, regardless of disability, students who were in inclusive settings were healthier, made more progress at school, they looked forward to going to school, and they had more interactions with peers. So let's talk a little bit about peers. Some of the things that um, uh, comes up often in discussion and certainly comes up in some of the research is this notion that if I put a child with special needs into a regular class, the kids in the regular class will suffer because of that. So within the research literature, there is often concern from educators and parents about the potential impact of having students with exceptionalities in the classroom. How will it affect the other students? A systematic review of the literature on inclusion over the last 20 years suggests that overall, including students in the regular class does not have a negative impact on the academic achievement of others. So one of the things we often hear is, if the teacher has to spend all the time with Joey, then the other kids will suffer academically. The research doesn't bear that out. The research actually tells us that there is no negative impact on the academics of the other kids. More interestingly, the research also tells us that for the kids in the regular class, when we examine the attitudes of the peers in the regular class towards the inclusion of students, it has been generally noted that there's a positive orientation towards inclusion. Positive results have also been found in terms of an increase in advocacy and more tolerant attitudes on the part of the regular students in inclusive settings. So not only do they not suffer academically, but socially and in terms of advocacy, they become more positive in terms of including people with exceptionalities. One could certainly extrapolate on that to think about children in regular classrooms as being future employers who would then have no hesitation to hire somebody who may seem different or be different because in an inclusive classroom they would not have been different. Just to give you an example of some of the things that happen when we some of the things that happen when we isolate people from their peers, um, one of the one of the situations that uh, that I have come across over the last few years is a young girl who had a best friend with Down syndrome who went to school with her from grade one to grade six, and then in grade seven the uh, little girl with Down syndrome was put into a class with low enrollment and specialized literacy. And now, five years later in high school, they have no relationship at all. And these are the words of this 16-year-old girl. She said, I can't go to see her anymore. She's talking about her friend who had Down syndrome. I'm so uncomfortable in her house. And this is a girl. These are two girls who had sleepovers every week. She's forgotten how to talk to me, and we have nothing in common. Because of her segregation, she has learned only one way of socializing. I've learned lots of ways. I know who's good to hang around with and who to avoid. Why can't she have the same chance as I did? I miss her as a friend. When we talk about the opportunity for people with disabilities to associate with other people, an, a Canadian author, Sonia Grover, talks about a very famous case in Ontario called the Emily Eaton case. And the Emily Eaton case is a case of a, a girl whose parents wanted her to be included. It was, it was many years ago. And the, uh, the court system actually ruled against her and they were the school system was allowed to continue to segregate her. But what Sonia Grover wrote in 2001 is that no other group in a democratic society, save the disabled student, needs to meet a compensatory test 
competency test in order to exercise a constitutionally guaranteed right to freedom of association where that group poses no risk. What she did was a review of the legislation around segregation and inclusion and what she said was that under the law of Canada there's no other group of people in this country who are denied access to their peers unless they pose a threat except for those who have disabilities. I told you my PowerPoints are really boring. So look at educators, teachers, and some of you may be surprised to find out that overwhelmingly across the research, classroom teachers have found, been found to have a positive attitude towards inclusion. Uh, those teachers, I've read studies that look at teachers who are entering the profession and those who are in the profession, and generally speaking, teachers want kids of all types to be in their classroom. Some of the reasons why teachers feel this way or some of the things that help teachers be successful in inclusive settings is that they need to have a belief that all students can achieve. They need to have high level beliefs about knowledge and learning and the degree to which the teacher feels he or she can make a difference in a student learning. So what they're saying is that if a teacher has what we would call in the field this sort of internal locus of control, this notion that I can actually have, I have the power to influence children that when teachers feel that way, they feel excited and they feel welcoming to students who are different. While there is in the literature a real willingness on the part of teachers to include students, there are concerns that come up almost every single time and those concerns are over and, and uh, these are the main ones. Lack of training. Teachers are very concerned over lack of training and there are teacher education programs. Brock University is not one of them, but there are teacher education programs in the province where absolutely no special education training is part of teacher training. It is not a requirement in the province of Ontario and it has been um, a real trial over the last number of years to try and make it so. We believe at universities that everyone should be required to do some training in working with uh, students who are different. Uh, teachers have concerns over classroom management. They have concerns over the kind of collaboration that can happen between people with expertise and people without expertise. And they feel as though they don't have enough support, and that can be physical support or personnel support. And finally, let's have a look at leaders. And when I say leaders, I'm talking about principals, school principals. Um, or superintendents, but mostly principals in this case. Evidence clearly indicates that the environment, environment and culture of a school setting can have a direct impact on the acceptance of students with exceptionalities. In general, across the research on education, the principal has been shown to be an extremely important factor in the success of a school setting. And that actually in the research is undisputed. The principal actually has been found to be the most important and central component to the culture of a school and how a school works. The role of a school principal has been shown to be pivotal for fostering new meaning, promoting inclusive school cultures and instructional programs, as well as building relationships between schools and communities. The willingness of administrators to support inclusive environments has been linked to issues of training and expertise. There is evidence to suggest that for administrators, additional training in the area of special ed, as well as positive experiences with students with exceptionalities, are important components for the development and maintaining of inclusive, of inclusive environments. So how a principal was trained and, and the types of experiences that a principal had, whether they've been positive or negative, negative, has a distinct influence on how the school culture wraps itself around the idea of inclusion or non-inclusion. And just to end off, I will talk a little bit about leadership and I'm going to share a story about uh, someone who I think is a wonderful leader. And he was the principal of um, a child that I knew named Scotty Christensen, and I knew his mom, Glory Christensen, and some of, some of you who are listening may know those people. So I wanted to give them credit for the story. Um, I know that when Scotty was in high school in the Hamilton Catholic Board, his, his uh, mom had made an arrangement with the principal that his peers would pick his courses for him. And so Scotty had, Scotty had been born with no eyes, and when they Dis, uh, along with multiple other disabilities. When his peers picked his courses, they picked photography for him. And the principal, as a leader, was reviewing the course uh, offerings for Scotty, and rather than saying, he can't take this course, this is ridiculous, 
this child can't see anything. Why would you pick this course? He didn't do that. He picked up the phone and he called Gloria and he said, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm open to this, but I really I, I need to have some more explanation. So she came to the school, Scotty came to the meeting, his friends came to the meeting, and the principal asked them. He said, why did, why did you pick photography? And the kids said the following. They said, well, you always tell us that the whole school is Scotty's school. And we figure what we'll do is we'll get down to the level of Scotty's wheelchair, and when he turns his head in a particular direction, we'll take a picture of that. And anyway, sir, everybody goofs off in photography, and why shouldn't Scotty get to goof off? They had a perfect rationale for why he should take photography, and that principal, as a leader, not only felt that it was appropriate to consult with them about that, but he perfectly understood the rationale, and Scotty did photography. So I hope that was informative, and thank you very much.